So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Prokash. I work for um, on contract actually for Peace Actions National Office, um, co-leading um, these trainings. And my co-workshop leaders are uh, Lindsay Koshgarian and Doug Hall from National Priorities Project. Susie Nord uh, pulled this training together. Um, and uh, this is the agenda. We're going to talk just to establish some context about the federal budget. How is the federal budget spending its money uh, and how does that affect us? Then we will look at the obstacles to um, cutting the Pentagon budget and moving that money into other programs. Um, we'll look at uh, kind of fear and the dominant narrative about national security, about the jobs argument, about um, kind of, well, how do we do it? Where, where do we acquire the political power to actually move the money? And then we'll look at the specific challenge with tax phobia and uh, kind of the, the budget gridlock and what do we do with that? Well, I'm Lindsay Kashgarian with National Priorities Project. Um, and we're based in Northampton, Massachusetts. We also have staff in Maine and Maryland. Um, and our reason for being is to educate regular people about the federal budget, about where the money goes, where the money comes from, um, and what you can do about it if you don't like where the money is going to or coming from. Um, National Priorities Project is over 30 years old now, and we have a long history, particularly of focusing on spending on military and security issues. Um, one of our features is a cost of war counter that's been running um, that looks at the costs of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan since 2001. And, um, and we'll be seeing some of that information here uh, but that's the kind of information that we try to provide for people. Um, we also try to provide for people information about where your tax dollars go, which, um, so you all were given, I hope everyone got a chance to do this, to do our, our nickel poll here to say where you want your tax dollar to go. Uh, for those of you who may have wandered in a little bit later and didn't get a chance to do it, um, everyone was given 20 stickers, so a, a dollar, with where each sticker was a nickel, and asked to allocate it where they would want their federal spending to go. And as you can see, this is the result. It looks like we have, uh, without counting, we have quite a bit there for education, for health care, um, unemployment and labor, transportation, energy and environment, housing and community. Um, few stickers for military, even if a few people even want to pay down the national debt. Um, so. This is what it looks like according to what you all said you would like to see. And then up on the screen, which is out of focus, you can see where it actually goes. So out of your federal income taxes, 27 cents of every dollar goes to the military. That includes the Department of Defense base budget that includes um, a separate war spending fund that we currently have on the books called Overseas Contingency Operations. It includes spending on nuclear weapons. Uh, it includes foreign military aid. What it does not include is uh, spending on veterans, which you can see is its own category uh, at only six cents of every dollar. And speaking of six cents of every dollar, of that 27 cents on the military, only six cents of that actually goes to pay our troops. The rest is procurement, research and development, operations, but not actually supporting our troops directly. So as you can see, this is quite different than where you all chose to put your dots. What's not up here is, are things that are not paid out of your income tax dollar. So most notably that's Social Security and Medicare. And we'll show some, I'll show a couple of graphs that do show you some, spent, some of that spending. Um, but that's because those have their own separate trust funds, their own separate source of taxes that show up as FICA on your payroll taxes. Um, they're not things that are funded by your income tax dollar. The black budget, uh, for those who don't know, is um, spending that is, uh, it's classified. So it's not off the budget, it's in there 
but it's not um, what the spending is on is classified. It's very visible. So it's very invisible. Um, and there was a there was the Edward Snowden leak was a big leak that sort of let people in to see how much that actually is of the federal budget, and I think it was about fifty billion dollars at the time. Um, so definitely some of that goes in the military category. Maybe possibly a little bit of it goes in government, but I can tell you that most of what government is is Department of Justice. It's the IRS. Um, it's some other sort of law enforcement that's not quite so murky. Um, and healthcare is the 22nd biggest category at 26 cents of every dollar. That has been growing. Um, that is largely because Medicaid is included here. Um, and those are the costs of Medicaid, even though the services aren't necessarily increasing that much, the costs are. Um, last year, I think that was only about 23 cents on the dollar. So um, that is increasing. Here you have sort of in graphic form our federal budget process. And so if you start in the upper left box, you see an example of some government agencies, Department of Defense, Department of Agriculture, Department of Education, but it's really pretty much every major federal agency has a role in giving input into the Office of Management and Budget, which is the White House arm that helps the president set his budget for the coming fiscal year. So beginning actually in the spring, all the departments, so now the departments are already sort of collecting information about what funding they may need. And now the, the departments themselves are at this point are looking forward to fiscal year 2017 even though fiscal year 2016 hasn't even started yet and will start in October. Um, so this process really starts very early with the departments reviewing their budgets, seeing where they need more money, seeing what programs they may be able to cut or even eliminate. And then they provide that information to the Office of Management and Budget, which sort of turns it out, gives feedback back to the departments. There's sort of a cycle of feedback loop there that happens. And ultimately, that goes into the president's budget, which is supposed to be released in February. And this year it was, which is not always a given. Um, but this February, President Obama released his would-be budget for the country. And of course, that budget is just a suggestion. It has no power of law. Congress doesn't really have to listen to it. Um, but it's what the president would like to see. And it's important for a couple of reasons. For one, it sort of kicks off the budget game for the rest of the year and the rest of the discussion. It's also the only budget that actually incorporates that input from the departments on what they want um, and what they need. So it has sort of the expertise and the information from the departments themselves that actually run the programs behind it. So that happened this year in February. Uh, the next two steps here, you just kind of see the House and Senate running in parallel in the blue boxes there with the House on top and the Senate on the bottom. So the House and the Senate consider the, the President's budget submission, they come up with their own budget resolutions, uh, which this year they did. Um, this year, the House and Senate budget resolutions both called for um, essentially the same spending on defense that President Obama called for, about $612 billion. And on non-defense, they were drastically different. Uh, so the president called for increased spending on non-defense domestic priorities like education, health care. Uh, transportation, infrastructure. The House budget would have cut that spending by almost $800 billion over the next 10 years. And the Senate budget would have cut by, I think, around $300 billion. Since then, that, the, those budgets came out uh, a couple months ago now. And just within the last few weeks, the Senate and the House came together on a single budget resolution that now would keep defense spending at about $612 billion, the same as what the president asked for, um, but would cut domestic spending on everything else by an additional, over the next 10 years, by an additional almost $500 billion. And that's assuming that what we all know is sequestration, the budget caps from the Budget Control Act. That's assuming that that continues. They would cut even more than that. So sequestration is already a very, um, a very limiting and very draconian set of cuts. How about inflation? In, in uh, so the numbers I'm talking about are all, um, they're not inflation adjusted. So $500 billion of cuts is $500 billion of real dollars. 
so they're not they're certainly not increasing things to keep up with inflation so um, so right now where we are is that we have a budget resolution from the House and the Senate that they've both agreed to um, that has very large cuts um, for domestic non-defense spending and starts to ramp up defense spending in ways that I'll talk about more as I go on. Um, the next steps in the process is that the House and Senate are supposed to do appropriations bills. Um, this is where it kind of starts to get serious, where it actually starts to turn into law that could become our actual budget for next year. Um, however, it's been more than 20 years since that process has actually been followed. It's supposed to be that the House and Senate both come up with 12 separate appropriations bills that fund the 12 different parts of the government. They then conference those together, come to a single set of 12 appropriations bills, which then go to the president for his signature or veto. Um, as I said, that has not happened that way in 20 years. Um, in recent years, we've had more um, continuing resolutions that continue the process where, so the funding from the previous fiscal year is held into the, into the start of the new fiscal year until Congress and the president can come to an agreement. Um, we've had omnibus bills, which wrap all of the 12 bills into one so that you have to vote either yes or no on the entire budget for the country rather than on separate pieces of it as a member of Congress. Um, and that's, that's been the way that things have been happening. Last year we had um, an actual combination that folks may remember being referred to as the Cromnibus, um, where it was an omnibus bill, so it was everything, all parts of the government funded into one bill but there was also an aspect of it where the Department of Homeland Security was only funded until February. And we got past that hurdle. They continued funding for the Department of Homeland Security at the end of February, um, going through the rest of the fiscal year. So now we're firmly back into considering what the budget will look like for fiscal year 2016, which starts October 1st. Just yesterday, the House of Representatives passed the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, that act does not actually uh, author, it authorizes spending, but it doesn't actually allow spending by the government. Um, that will still happen in the appropriations process, but it's a really important indicator of where Congress is headed in terms of what they want to see on defense spending. So what the House authorized was $612 billion of spending on defense. Uh, $90 billion of that is part of the Overseas Contingency Operations Fund, which is the war fund. And $38 billion of that fund is estimated to be spending that should be part of the Pentagon's regular budget. And the reason it's not is because they're looking for a way to shift that funding so that they can, on paper, follow the limits set by the Budget Control Act for defense spending, even while, in reality, there's a separate Overseas, Contin operation, overseas Contingency Operations Fund that is not subject to budget caps and allows them to increase defense spending. And of course, there's no similar fund for non-defense domestic spending. There's no similar fund for education or infrastructure or healthcare or any of those things that we all said we wanted to spend our money on. So I went over the process a bit and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the actual dollars in the federal budget and where they're going, um, where they're coming from and, and what's happening. This is the 2015 budget, so this is our current fiscal year. Um, this shows you where the money comes from and where the money goes. So up at the top, you have where the money comes from. You have tax revenues. That big blue box over on the left is federal funds. Um, those are essentially your income tax dollars, corporate income tax dollars, um, and other sources of income. That smaller yellowy orange box on the right is trust funds. So that includes FICA, payroll taxes for Social Security and Medicare, um, and some other trust funds, things like the Highway Trust Fund, which is notable for being both short of money and the major federal funding source to maintain our nation's highways, um, go in that box. Uh, and that's about $1.1 trillion, whereas federal funds are about $2 trillion. Um, and then there's borrowing which this year is expected to be about 583 billion or half a trillion dollars. And then you can see the arrows kind of flow a little bit all over the place, but into where the money goes. Um, the biggest chunk 
about two thirds of our federal budget is mandatory spending. Um, that's the part of the budget that is not wrapped up in this process that I just talked about, um, but that is determined by things like Social Security and Medicare eligibility rules, and things that are set in place usually for more than one in law for more than one year at a time. Um, so it's not part of the annual budget process that we go through. That's about $2.45 trillion this year. The smaller purple box is discretionary spending, and that is the box that is subject to the process I just talked about. Uh, that's about $1.1 trillion this year, and that includes pretty much all spending on our military, on education. It includes quite a bit of healthcare spending, uh, pretty much all of the federal spending on housing, um, a lot of transportation spending, energy spending, spending on science, things like that all fall into the discretionary budget. And then of course there is the smallest red box is our payments on interest on our national debt, which this year is about 229 billion or about 6% of our budget this year. And of course, all of that federal spending eventually does come back to our cities and towns and where we live. So looking at New Hampshire specifically, uh, we look at four major ways that federal spending comes into states. The first is directly to state government. And in New Hampshire, that's about $1.7 billion. That should actually say 27% of the state's budget um, comes from the federal government. And that's about, that's about average. Um, the average for the United States is 30% of each state's budget comes from the federal government. And that includes things like um, assistance for housing, Section 8 and public housing. It includes um, public assistance in the form of Medicaid, TANF, um, the low-income housing allowance, uh, heating allowance, um, block grants doesn't include assistance that goes directly to individuals. So it doesn't include um, Social Security or Medicare or food stamps. State residents directly, that's where you see Medicare, Social Security, food stamps. That's about $7.7 .7 billion in New Hampshire. Federal contracts are $1.8 billion in New Hampshire and 80 two or 83% of that is defense contracts. Which in many states, the Department of Defense is the biggest source of, um, of federal contracts, right, specifically. So that's not terribly unusual, although that's still a pretty high percentage. And finally, there are direct federal employees, um, which in New Hampshire draw about $965 million in compensations, which is pay and benefits. And 17% of that is military personnel. And so all of that adds up to about $12 billion of federal money that comes into New Hampshire. So looking at that chunk that goes direct to state government that makes up 27% of New Hampshire's state budget, there's about 80 million up on the top left, that's housing and community development, so that's Section 8, public housing, other forms of housing assistance, um, and some community development funds. About 791 million is for public assistance, which again is largely Medicaid, but also um, TANF and LIHEAP uh, and other, other programs. 247 million is for education, like Title I, um, Head Start and some of the small funds that have been granted for the, the President's proposed preschool for all program, things like that, funding for special education. 177 million goes to transportation, which is public airports, uh, highways, mass transit. 33 million goes to natural resources and agriculture. Um, which is conservation, flood prevention, fish and wildlife, and 27 million goes to health and hospitals, which is WIC, or Women, Infants, and Children Program, um, healthcare for veterans, EPA Superfund, and other programs. 
And just to total this up again, this is 1.7 billion. So all of this put together is about the same as the federal contracts that was 1.8 billion that come into New Hampshire. And remember that almost all of that is defense contracts. So put all of these things together, you have something that's about the same as defense contracts. So back to the total national federal budget, not just New Hampshire. Um, I mentioned this before, but again, about two thirds of it is mandatory spending that goes to Social Security and Medicare. About a third is discretionary spending, which includes all of those things that we just talked about. And then 6% is payment for interest on debt. Now looking at just the discretionary spending piece of that, here we are in 2015. This number has changed, sort of wobbled a little bit over the years, but has stayed solidly above half of the discretionary budget for military spending. And then as you can see, everything else is a much smaller piece. So all education funding is about $70 billion, which is 6% of the discretionary budget. Um, so military spending is almost 10 times as much. Veterans benefits, uh, also about 6%. Military spending is also about 10 times as much as we pay actually to take care of our veterans. Um, and all the categories are just sort of smaller and smaller from there. Government, like I said, is largely federal law enforcement, but it's also the IRS and Treasury, um, sort of, you know, government functions that don't fit in any sort of program area. And altogether, discretionary spending in 2015 is about $1.1 trillion. Now, this is discretionary spending. So the blue line is military, just like the blue pie piece was military. The yellow is everything else in that pie. And this shows you over time, starting in 1976 uh, through this year, 2015, how those pieces have related to each other. Um, so over on the left, you have, that's billions of dollars, and this is inflation adjusted to 2015. So you can see that the blue line is almost always above the yellow line. The one exception was the 2009, the 2008 Recovery Act um, to get out of the recession where domestic non-defense spending kind of spiked. So other than that spike, we're almost always spending more, other than sort of this brief period that you see at the beginning during the 70s, we're almost always spending more on military spending than we are on all other spending in this country. So here, just to look at our military spending another way, United States military spending, again, is the blue bar. And here you see the next nine countries. Of course, the United States is number one. Um, this number, again, has changed somewhat over the years, but right now we're at fully more than a third of world military spending just from the United States. Um, and right now that's about the same as the next seven countries combined. It's also more about three times as much as number two, China, um, the big threat. And I think it works out to like between seven and nine times as much as Russia, the big threat. Um, so the United States is certainly pulling its weight in the world in terms of military spending. So here you see how we actually, a little bit of how we actually spend that money. Um, we also have additional materials on our website that really go into detail for this year about how that money is being spent, including on different weapons systems, things like military pay, even by force. So you know how much is Air Force versus Navy. Um, we have a lot, a lot more of that information available on our website, but this is sort of a big picture. So in 2015, we're spending almost 600 billion on our military. And the way that breaks down is 496 billion is the Department of Defense base budget. The OCO war fund, the slush fund, is 64 billion this year, and that's the fund that Congress is talking about upping to 90 billion for next year. Um, and that doesn't include a separate piece of OCO funding that goes to the State Department. This year, we're spending about 18 billion on nuclear weapons and associated costs, which uh, is pretty level with what we've been spending in recent years, at three percent. 12 billion on international security assistance, that's aid to foreign militaries, and 1% on other. When you spend money on the military, you do get some jobs. When you spend money on anything, you do get some jobs. Um, 
but here's what you can get if you spend a billion dollars of federal money in, start in different ways. This is according to a UMass study that um, came out in 2011. So if you spend a billion dollars on the military, you get 11,200 jobs. If you spend a billion dollars on tax cuts to, to individuals and assume that those people actually spend that money, um, as opposed to stashing it under the mattress somewhere, you get about 15,000 jobs. If you spend a billion dollars on clean energy technology, you could get almost 17,000 jobs. If you spend a billion dollars on healthcare, you could get more than 17,000 jobs. And if you spend that billion dollars on education, you could get 26 billion jobs. So same amount of money, billion dollars, if what you care about is jobs, this should certainly play into what decisions you make about how to spend that money. When you use the term direct jobs in this analysis, that actually means something very specific. So um, it's, it's teachers, but it's also jobs that are created by, um, so you know, if you spend money on schools, exactly right. If there's a textbook manufacturer in this, like that creates more jobs there. It creates more jobs at the grocery store when the teachers go to the grocery store and spend their paycheck. So it kind of includes those ripple effects as well as the direct jobs. So just because people often, when they think about cutting military spending, think about veterans, and as we've already talked about, and as I think people in this room are pretty familiar with, that does not include, we're not talking about the money that we spend on veterans. It's a separate piece of the pie. Um, but to take a look at that piece of the pie, here's what it looks like. So total spending on veterans affairs is the blue line. As you can see in recent years, so this chart goes from 1976 yeah, yeah. To, um, to 2015. Total spending is going up, but per spending per veteran right now is also going up, um, more so than total spending because World War II generation vets are moving on. Mm -hmm. The current generation of veterans is actually higher per vet, um, even though we're having like a slight dip right now, very recently. Um, and then you can see two big piece, the two big pieces of this are income security, um, so that's you know, payments to vets and health care, which are about even for spending. And finally, also not completely included in this conversation is Homeland Security funding, which is sort of our other defense department. Um, so the total Homeland Security funding is that green line up at the top. And there's some Defense Department funding that's actually categor categorized also as Homeland Security. So that's that yellow line there, you can see. Um, but it's a relatively small piece of it. Um, and then the blue line is non-Defense Department. And that is scattered across almost every department you can imagine. It's certainly Department of Homeland Security, but it's also Department of Commerce, Department of Agriculture, um, Department of Transportation. It's just about everywhere. All over the federal budget is Homeland Security funding. <laughs> And on Homeland Security total in 2015, we're spending over $70 billion this year. So that's the end of my Pentagon spending presentation.